if you're following along in Brother Layton's book, Journey to Hope, which is uh, available on Amazon, looks like this. Uh, if you're following along in his book, we're in the chapter titled, The Man Who Called Jesus by Name. Chapter 12 in his book. This is the next to last week of the case studies. Uh, next week, we're going to jam two cases in to just one week. Um, but the, the lesson for today, the man who called Jesus by name, you can find uh, the, the passage in Luke 23. So flip over there uh, in your Bibles, your apps, to Luke chapter 23. <clears throat> this is part of the story of the crucifixion. And you can find the crucifixion, of course, recorded in all four Gospels. It's foretold in the Old Testament. It's retold in the other books of the New Testament. Um, the part of the crucifixion scene that includes the other folks who are crucified alongside Jesus is recorded also in all four Gospels. Three of the Gospels specify that the other two folks were criminals. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what that meant shortly. But only the account of Luke the physician records the interaction among the criminal on the left, the criminal on the right, and Jesus in the middle. Again, this is not a contradiction. Um, we accept as an article of faith that the Holy Spirit caused one writer to record one aspect while another writer records a different perspective. And all of this has the purpose of preventing, presenting to us a completely sufficient book. A book that is completely sufficient for life and for godliness. So we'll read together as you follow along in whatever version you have in front of you. I've got the old New International Version in front of me. Uh, or if you don't have a device or a book open right in front of you, please listen intently as I read from the crucifixion account by Luke. Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 43. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. You will hear nothing better today than God's Word. Whether I read it, whether you read it yourself, or you hear someone else say it. So there are many memorable moments in the life of Christ. Uh, we're not, let's see, what is today? Today's the 19th. So we're not quite two months after the Christmas holiday when this dark and fallen world amazingly recognizes that a Savior was born. And it's just that, that is a wonder to me. Uh, you know, they, they might have the day wrong, they might have the month wrong, but the idea that this fallen world recognizes that a Savior was born is just amazing. Other less popular but no less memorable events include the young Jesus staying behind at the temple. Remember that? Later, Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist, and then his immediate and miraculous transport to the Desert of Temptation. Uh, we've studied in class some of his amazing healings. He healed of leprosy. He healed of an issue of blood. 
He healed the demon possession. He healed by forgiving Zacchaeus' sin. And he healed by forgiving of adultery. Our lesson last week. Jesus did so many things that if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books. That's a paraphrase of John 21, 25, not my original words there. As is obvious from today's reading from Scripture, the significant event that we're focusing on today is Jesus' interaction with a criminal condemned to share in the horrible death of crucifixion. So I don't know about y'all, but Brother Jet's words before communion last week were hard for me to hear. Maybe you, if you were here, you, you heard him speak. He talked about what Jesus went through on the cross, the physical elements of it. I'm glad that the description of Jesus' physical suffering on the cross still makes me feel bad every time I hear about it. I can still remember the first time that I heard a description of the physical elements of crucifixion. I think I've mentioned before, either in this venue or in others, that I grew up in a very conservative and legalistic congregation of the Lord's Church. But the preachers and the men who led communion weren't the fire and brimstone types. Um, but when I was 12 years old, a visiting preacher from Ireland, Brother Jim McGuigan, who may be familiar, so I see a head nod or two. Uh, Brother Jim McGuigan was touring around, and he stopped to, to teach uh, a lesson in Odessa, Texas, where I grew up. And he delivered a flamethrower of a sermon about the physical suffering of Jesus on the cross. And I was moved at 12 years old. I was also kind of scared and unsure of what to do. But less than a week later, that sermon that Jim McGuigan taught was the impetus for my baptism. It was the following Friday uh, that I, didn't, I couldn't wait any longer. And I remember the difference between how I felt when Brother McGuigan preached that sermon as I stood on the wrong side of salvation, and he, he showed me what it cost, he, Brother McGuigan, showed me what it cost Jesus to get me on the right side of salvation. But I remember how I felt then, and then I remember how I felt, even today, how I felt six years later. I was 18 years old, and Brother Barry Whitefield, who had gone off to medical school and, and was back for a, a holiday visit, <clears throat> he described in medical terms, the physical suffering of Jesus on the cross to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. The distinction between the, how I felt from being on one side, the wrong side of the cross, and being on the right side of salvation, it was, it was different. And I remember that difference. And I remember, too, what Brother Jet said from the pulpit. And I think his comments last week are a really good backdrop for today's class. But here in Scripture, in these few verses that capture Jesus' horrible but necessary sacrifice, we see the fulfillment of God's promise to save those who come to Jesus in simple faith and humility. We see the entirety of the gospel in this brief moment of time. So this criminal, this particular criminal that we're focusing on today, who's known popularly as the thief on the cross, made a request that changed his eternal destination. The immediate outcome of justice served for his criminal behavior wasn't changed. It was not Roman practice to pardon the crucified. They wouldn't put him on a cross and then take him down. Nor were they lax in carrying out this particular form of death sentence. When a Roman hung a fellow on a cross, that fellow died. They were quite good at it. Brutally effective. Now, even though Scripture doesn't tell us, it doesn't directly say that the thief died on his cross, Roman soldiers came and broke his legs so that he'd hurry up and die so his body could be taken off the cross before night fell and the Sabbath began. So it's eminently reasonable, then, to believe that the thief did die as a result of his crimes. But his change of heart and his turning to Jesus would resonate through eternity. So in the lesson today, 
chapter 12 of Brother Layton's book, will review the event of the crucifixion of Jesus that involved these two other condemned men. Like some of the other cases we've studied, all of the Gospels record this event. But our focus will be on Luke's account of the penitent criminal as he journeys from hopelessness to hopefulness. So why don't we start with what we don't know? You know, you, you know what you know, you don't know what you don't know, and then you, you have the unknown unknowns and the unknown knowns and the known knowns. Uh, uh. Well, here's what we don't know. We actually we don't know a lot. Um, and we know that we don't know a lot. And we don't know some things that we don't know, and there are probably a whole lot of those too. But here's what we don't know to start off with. We don't know the background of the two criminals who died with Jesus that day. The gospel just records that Jesus was crucified be between two criminals. Many translations use the word thieves, particularly earlier translations in English. But the Greek word translated as thief in many older translations doesn't neatly match our understanding of that Greek word as it's translated today. Uh, newer translations use the more general word criminal. And paralleling modern translation with what we've learned of Roman custom also helps us understand the context more fully. So if a thief stole from his master and the thief was not a Roman citizen or was a slave, regardless of citizenship, it's likely that that thief would be crucified. That is, crucifixion would be administered by the Romans as a fitting and appropriate punishment for that crime committed by that class of person. Regardless of citizenship, though, someone who rebelled against the Roman government would likely have received the punishment of crucifixion for being a traitor. A person who today we might call a petty thief would not likely have been punished for simple theft by crucifixion. Some Bible scholars speculate that the two men were lifelong criminals. Perhaps they were criminal masterminds. <clears throat> Some Bible scholars think that they were rebels associated with Barabbas who had perhaps per performed some sort of theft in the prosecution of their rebellion. Oh, we don't know. They were maybe associated with Barabbas. Uh, also, we don't know. Uh, Barabbas was a famous rebel who was awaiting crucifixion at that time. You'll remember that Pilate offered to release either Barabbas or Jesus. The chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas. Yeah, that guy. Matthew 27, 20 and 21 is where that reference comes. But we simply don't know the background of these two criminals. We don't know their names. We don't know if they were Jews. We don't know what cities they were from. We don't know their nationalities. We don't even know their actual crimes. I think it's likely that they were Jews. Based on the thing about taking the bodies down before the Sabbath, that was a very Jewish thing, and that might not have, you know, they might have wanted some heathen, you know, Gentile bodies taken down before the Sabbath. I don't, I don't know. We just don't know. But those details about who these men were, their names, their nationalities, their religion, etc., were not the focus of this particular event during the crucifixion of Jesus. But despite the vast amount of things that we don't know, we certainly can learn from these two criminals something that can help us in our relationship with Jesus. So these three men, two criminals and Jesus, were led to Mount Calvary. It was a place often used for crucifixions. Based on biblical descriptions, it was just outside the city walls, near one of the city gates, near a significant road leading into the city. This would have made a perfect place for a modern times billboard. You think about it, a, a big road leading into a town, everybody who comes in can see the billboard. Maybe that's one of the reasons why this place was used for crucifixions. A deterrent display, maybe, of punishment that awaits criminals under Roman rule. But on the day of this event, only two of the three men on crosses were criminals. The other man, who was Jesus of Nazareth, was not only innocent of any crime, he was also innocent of any sin at all. Completely and perfectly innocent. 
And this event follows an arrest just after midnight. In the wee hours of the morning, an appearance before the chief priest to formalize the charge. The mockery of a trial that began just after the sun came up. The stripping and scourging that punctuated the morning hours. The slow walk up Calvary's hill. The pounding of the nails at 9 a.m. All this leads us to the waiting. For around three hours, Jesus hangs on the cross between the two criminals. As the agonizing time drags on, the two criminals, along with the soldiers and many others who were either walking by or maybe had stopped there to watch, waiting at the scene of the crucifixion, many of these folks are hurling insults at Jesus and mocking him. <laughs> if you're such a miracle worker, get yourself out of this mess. Maybe if they're from Alabama or Texas, they'd have said something like that. Or said it that way. Uh, one of the criminals demands proof. If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. That's Luke 23, 39 in the literal standard version. That is not Cain Tuck vernacular. Both criminals heard what was said by the people around Jesus. And they also heard Jesus' words and Jesus' responses to the insults and the mockery. They both heard Jesus asking God to forgive his tormentors. Both of them saw the extra helping of humiliation that Jesus bore. Both of them saw Jesus' kindness in providing for his mother. That's recorded in John's account of the crucifixion. John 19, 25 through 27. Both men had the opportunity to hurl insults at Jesus. And Mark 15, 32 records that both exercised that opportunity as they were tortured. But as the painful moments pass, at some point during that stretch, one of the criminals has a change of heart. Both criminals have the opportunity to have this change of heart. But the Bible records only one of them came to believe Jesus was the epitome of spiritual royalty. Hanging on a cross, this criminal comes to this realization. And becomes a newly minted disciple of Christ. Even there on a cross. Despite being tortured to death. On a cross. This newly minted disciple rebukes his fellow criminal. He attests to Jesus' innocence. And then speaks directly to Jesus. Making a final plea. A final plea from a condemned man. Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. This statement recorded for us in scripture. Proves the criminal had gained powerful insights from Jesus. He recognizes who Jesus is and calls him by name. He recognizes what Jesus can do. He recognizes he, the criminal, has a need that only Jesus can satisfy. And he recognizes that his need transcends the physical world into the eternal kingdom of Christ. So just like those who came humbly to Jesus as he walked freely through the land during the years of his ministry, this repentant criminal, in his simple statements, sought mercy and forgiveness. The criminal's heartfelt request came during a time of hopelessness in the final moments of his life. And Jesus responds with more than what the criminal could have dared to hope for. Jesus doesn't bring up the criminal's lifetime of sin. Jesus doesn't even bring up the recent insults and mockery. Instead, Jesus hears the humble plea and gives the criminal precious hope. Brother Layton speculates in his book, maybe there was a glimmer of light in Jesus' eyes. Maybe even a loving smile crossed his face, even as he hung in agony on the cross, as he responds to this desperate soul seeking hope. 
In this moment, Jesus offers no words of judgment. Instead, he promises imminent paradise. So recall from your general knowledge of the crucifixion scene that Jesus died before the criminals did. The brutal Roman soldiers come and break the criminals' legs to hasten their death before sunset, but Jesus has already died by this time. So we know that Jesus died before the two criminals did. What transpired in the horrible hours or minutes, we don't know how long it was, between the death of Jesus and the final shock of searing pain and subsequent rapid merciful death, which I think came as a mercy. It wasn't a merciful way to die, but they were probably glad to be put out of that, that anguish. I, I don't know. I can't imagine. Well, we don't know what went through these two men's minds as Jesus dead between them and they still awaiting their fate, knowing what's coming. Perhaps this newly minted disciple of Christ, this penitent criminal, hung silent. Maybe his words to Jesus and hearing Jesus was the very last coherent thing that he was able to express. Wouldn't that have been a mercy? Perhaps that wasn't the case. Perhaps... Perhaps he lived a while. Perhaps he lived long enough to continue his ministry, if you would call it that, to the other criminal who hung on the other side of Jesus. Rebuking him if he continued to mock. Urging him to make the same profession of faith that he had made. Perhaps he communicated with the people who gathered around. No, you've got it wrong. You've got it wrong. This was the Son of God. Certainly, the miraculous events that occurred whenever Jesus died, the darkness that covered, that would have been a, a sign and he could have been a powerful preacher from a cross at that time. We don't know. We don't know. But we do know that Jesus knew the redeemed criminal was not going to give up his faith. The Bible doesn't tell us what this criminal did after this. The Bible focuses instead on the criminal's statement of faith and Jesus' act of mercy and grace. What a Savior. Brother Leighton, amen. But he also mentioned several times in his book, and I've highlighted it before as well, that Jesus came to earth to provide a way for all of humanity, all of humanity to be forgiven. All of humanity can be reconciled to God through Jesus. This is the general ministry of Jesus. You can call it that. You might call it something else. It's a general ministry. But Jesus personally saves every individual who obeys the gospel. What I mean by that is that there's no family plan like with your cell phone service provider. There's no herd immunity like you might get with a pandemic disease. There's no group on, if group on is still a thing, I don't know. There's no group on, though, when it comes to salvation. There's no Costco where you can get it at a discount. There's no class action lawsuit where if you call the lawyer now, you protect your rights, and if there's a settlement, you might get some money. None of this is the way salvation works. Salvation requires a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus. One-on-one. -on -one. So we emphasize, as uh, part of our ministry to other people, we emphasize that Jesus is the only name under heaven and on earth by which all men must be saved. And it is right for us to emphasize this. But what we don't emphasize enough is that the only person under heaven and on earth who must call on Jesus to be saved is me. Jesus saves me, but only if I personally come to him. It's intimate. But certainly, Jesus taught the masses, and the gospel is now available to be presented in so many different forms and formats that it can, it can reach millions at a time. But there are many examples when Jesus spoke to and touched an individual. 
This is one of those examples. Not exactly an intimate situation. But the plea was personal. And the response was personal. So think about this penitent criminal's plea. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I looked at this passage in 15 modern translations. 13 of them record the criminal addressing Jesus by using his first name alone. Brother Layton's studies, much more deep than mine, indicate that this is the only time recorded in Scripture where someone specifically addresses Jesus by that intimate first name alone. Other times, Jesus is addressed in more formal ways. But in that last and desperate moment, <clears throat> Jesus hears his name called. And that's a lesson for us. We must call on Jesus in a personal and intimate way. And if time allows, then we must develop and continue to develop a personal relationship with Jesus. An intimate relationship. Few of us, none of us that I can see here, are on a cross hours or minutes from death. We have time. What a glorious opportunity for us <clears throat> to take that initial connection with Christ and develop it richly. Now, that's an important lesson. It's a lesson for me. I hope it's a lesson for you as well. Another lesson we can learn, again, is that Jesus keeps his promises. As Jesus' life here is at its very end, that is his earthly life, one of the last things Jesus is recording, recorded as saying is another thing in a long line of examples of Jesus' faithfulness. As Jesus has done throughout his ministry, he honors the humble request by granting the eternal inheritance of citizenship in the kingdom of God to this repentant criminal. This keeps the promise that Jesus made in Matthew 10, 32 about acknowledging Jesus before men and then Jesus will acknowledge them before God. And Peter extends that promise Jesus made to this side of the cross in his Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2. And everyone means everyone. Even the most hardened criminals like the guy who was crucified with Jesus and even the most self-righteous, raised in the church, Sunday morning auditorium class teachers like me. Jesus can even save me. The criminal called on Jesus in simple faith. And he was rewarded because God is faithful. We don't even know how much the criminal knew about Jesus to, to kind of get back to the idea of the things that we don't know. We, we don't know how much he knew about Jesus. And I'm going to go off script a little bit here, and, and Dave's been very generous with me in these. Uh, but the context suggests to me that the criminal knew a little bit more about Jesus than what he heard the people in the crowd shouting. The reason I think that way, just in, even in just this immediate context, is that it reads to me like the crowd was shouting, Prophecy misinterpreted. All right. Very thin evidence there. But you know what's cool to me anyway? Maybe the word of God is powerful enough to work even in that circumstance. Because I wouldn't put it past God to work through the insults of the condemned to water whatever seeds of pure gospel that this criminal might have heard previously. Wouldn't it be just like God to show his power that way? Of course, on the other hand, the criminal might not have even thought he was expressing faith the way we understand it 2,000 years after the cross. Maybe all the thief was doing was trying to avoid punishment in the afterlife for all his bad choices during his life on earth. <clears throat> but this criminal turned in the right direction and called on Jesus. And Jesus was right there, full of compassion, full of mercy. And as Jesus had done so many times before during his ministry, he gave more 
than what was asked. He gave exactly what was needed. Isn't this just like us? No matter how far we run, no matter how much we've forgotten, no matter how little we feel of our first love, all we have to do is stop and turn around and Jesus is right there. It's never too late to come home. Never be afraid to come home. This relates, I think, <clears throat> to the, the parable of the prodigal son or the profligate father is the way I like to think of it too. Um, some consider that parable to be the greatest parable that Jesus ever taught. The parable is about God's forgiveness and acceptance. And in the remarkable lesson of the prodigal son, Jesus tells about a young man who took his inheritance early, wasted it on a lifestyle that was contrary to his father's wishes, and then things took a bad turn. The young man lost all that he had. He had no way to make a living. No one was there to come to his aid. And he's forced to take a horrible and filthy job as a pig herder, or maybe just a pig feeder. We don't know the extent of his duties. But he became so destitute, even with that job, that he was willing to eat the, the swill that was thrown out for the pigs to eat. Then, he comes to his senses. He remembers the love and kindness of his father that was extended not just to his family, but also to even the servants who were in his father's house. And as the memory of the father's love worked on this young man's heart, the prodigal son resolved to return home, not as a son, but as a servant. As the young man approaches his home with this resolve in his mind, the father sees him from afar off and runs to him. He throws his arms around his son. He calls for clothing. He calls for a ring. He calls for sandals, all signifying the full restoration of love. Back welcomed into the family. Not what you do for a servant. What you do for a son. This man, this father, then calls for a celebration, a big party, so that everyone can welcome the son who was previously considered dead and is now alive again. Now, there's a lot more to the parable, and a Sunday morning auditorium class knows some of the other things, other directions we might go, but, but listen this morning to what's quick and easy to understand. What's quick and easy to understand is that this story shows the restorative love of God through Jesus. And as the penitent criminal in Luke 23 is hanging on his cross, receiving the just punishment for his crimes with no hope in this life or the afterlife, he turns to Jesus. And like the Father does in the parable, Jesus grants forgiveness and hope and full membership in the family of God. So as we do each week, let's consider the penitent's journey from hopelessness to hopefulness through the waypoints of hope sparked, hope sensed, and hope seen. We don't know why or when the penitent criminal had a change of heart. Maybe it was the contrast between the hatred and scorn expressed by those who mocked Jesus and Jesus' own quiet and forgiving spirit and demeanor in response. Maybe the criminal knew something about this wandering preacher and had ignored it previously, but in this moment, maybe he just made a desperate plea from a man at death's door. What we know, though, is that something happened to spark hope in this man's heart. And it was this small beginning that led him to turn to Jesus. The next way point in the journey to hopefulness is hope sensed. A perception that drives action might be immature, but it's motivated by hope. So this penitent criminal acts on the spark of hope by first rebuking the other criminal for insulting Jesus. Then the criminal addresses Jesus with a simple statement, seeking redemption from the only one who can give it. 
The criminal has no right to expect mercy and grace, especially since only a little while ago he'd been mocking Jesus as well. But after hope was sparked, it blossomed into hope sensed as the penitent criminal acts in ways that show he has changed sides. He's a disciple of Jesus, and he confesses Jesus as king before men. And immediately following the former criminal but new disciples, rebuke of the mocker and his desperate plea to be remembered, a remarkable thing happens. Hope is seen. As Jesus immediately grants the request and promises its fulfillment before the sun will set that day. And not just the request to be remembered, but Jesus promises fellowship with himself, the king. And not just to be remembered, and not just to be in fellowship with the king, but Jesus also promises the place that they'll be together will be paradise. There's no way the hardened criminal could have ever expected that magnanimous, that profligate, that excessive grant of the riches of grace. But that's just Jesus being Jesus. Faithful to overflowing. Matthew records Jesus as saying, ask and you will receive. This penitent criminal asks, and boy did he ever receive. If the penitent criminal were with us today, maybe he'd love the song, Humble Yourself in the Sight of the Lord. The song encourages us by saying, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. This penitent criminal knew what it was like to be lifted up by men on a cross, a bloodstained cross, to be tortured to death. But he knows, even today he knows, what it means to be lifted up by Jesus. As a joint heir of the kingdom of heaven. And that's paradise. My hope for you is that this will encourage us to be lifted up by Jesus. And to share that gift of love with everyone. Next week, as I mentioned before, is the last time that I'll teach in this auditorium class. Two case studies jammed into one power-packed 44-minute stretch. Uh, and then after that week, Mark Brenneman will speak. Uh, he'll begin teaching from the Corinthians.